Uh, I was talking about the, 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 that Jesus has already moved and he said it's finished. Amen. I was, I was talking with my son last time. You know me with the soccer thing. I love soccer and my son plays for my team. I was so upset at him uh, because he, keep, he was keeping the ball too much. He was dribbling, dribbling, dribbling. I'm like, man, your team is losing and you keeping the, you want to dribble the whole world. I was not happy at, uh, about that at, at all. So I pulled him out. So when I pulled him out and I asked him, I said, what are you doing that? You know, there are people there. Why not you play as a team? And he told me, he said, listen, uh, daddy, every time I'm trying to give them the ball, they are not moving to receive it. So if I give it, somebody else is just going to get it. They have to move so that I can give them the ball. So I just be quiet. I couldn't say anything because he's right. Okay? If you want to receive, you have to position yourself very well so they can give it to you. So that gave me an idea about my sermon today. I'm like, okay, this is what happened in our Christian life. Jesus Christ has everything that we need. But we are not positioning ourselves to receive it. We'll be complaining about things. God, we need your move. We want you to act. We want you to do this. God has already moved. Hallelujah. He created from the first day until the sixth day, the seventh day, he rested. Hallelujah. Say to your neighbor, it's already done. Hallelujah. Complete, done. Amen. Amen. Now, and he's willing. He, he shows no favoritism. He has no respect of a person. There's no favorite. It's favoritism in, uh, in God. God loves all of us equally. Doesn't matter the color of your skin, your education level, where you're from. God loves you. Hallelujah. He loves you and he wants to bless you. But you got to put yourself in the position to receive. Amen. So we've been teaching how do you receive from God. Amen. What trigger do you pull so that the gun can work? There's a bullet in there, but you got to pull it so that it can go and work. So, trigger number one, we talk about having the caring mindset. Hallelujah. God blesses people who have the compassion in their heart. Tabitha died. People refused for her to die. They said, no, she cannot die. Hallelujah. They're crying and calling, you know, Peter to come all the way from, 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 from uh, 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 Lydia to come to Joppa so that the miracle can take place. They did not ask Peter to resurrect Tabitha, but they cry. They cry. The cloth they were showing to, 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 to Peter, something had to be done. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is loving. And if you are his son, or your do his daughter, you got to be loving. You must be loving. It's the nature of your father. Everything has to grow according to his kind. Is that right? When God created. So if you are God's son, then you have to produce the fruit of the spirit, which is love. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And how do we know that you have love? Because you have kindness, you have patience, you have this. These are byproduct of love. Hallelujah. So we have established that. Second thing we talk about was the atmosphere of faith. The Bible declares in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 6, anyone that approach God must first believe. Everybody say first. First requirement. Must first believe. Believe what? That God exists. Amen. And he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So no faith, no result. Hallelujah. Among the things that Jesus was always upset with his disciples was what? Lack of faith. He rebuked them more, not about not praying. When he came to tell them about prayer, he told them to pray because temptation could overtake them. He was not that upset. He actually said, can't you pray with me at least one hour? It's like he's begging them. Can't you pray? Okay? When people blame them for not fasting, he said, when I will go, they will fast. You understand? 
But when it comes to faith, he said, how long should I put up with you? I could see his face, angry. How long could I put up with you? In the other word, that the currency of the kingdom of God is faith. In the kingdom of God, we don't use U.S. dollar. We use faith. Hallelujah. We don't use pound. We use faith. Hallelujah. Because God did not use any money to make anything. He spoke a word. Hallelujah. He said, let it be light. And the light came in existence. And I love that scripture that said, without faith, okay, you cannot please God. Hallelujah. So if you don't believe that God exists, somebody's going to say, I believe that God exists. How many of us believe that God exists? All of us, right? But how do we know you believe is when problem comes. That's when we know you believe or you don't believe. Because that's your attitude shows you believe or you don't believe. Hallelujah. So God is calling us to have faith. How do you build faith? We say you build faith through hearing the word of God. Hallelujah. The word of God. Now, how do you build doubt? Hearing negative words from people. No wonder when Peter came in the room, he put everybody out. Hallelujah. He put everybody out. Why? Because he wants to make sure that the atmosphere has people who believe. People have faith. So I advise you, I'm not saying to hate people, but once you want to do something that are very important, so special, so dear to you, Make sure that you are not sharing your vision, your dream, your aspiration with people who will destroy it by word that they say because they don't believe to their God. The bigger difference between David and Goliath is what? I mean, uh, 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 David and Saul is what? Saul is looking at the size of uh, Goliath. David is looking at what? The size of God who made Goliath. That's the difference. When you look at the size of your problem, what happened to you? Fear come. And fear produces doubt, and doubt is the reason to any prayer you can make. Hallelujah. But when you look at the size of your God, then everything becomes small. Hallelujah. Something I've seen, I, I like to observe a lot. One time we were on the plane. We go higher, we go higher, we go higher. And then I noticed that the higher we went, the smaller the houses we became, were becoming. And at one point, I looked down, there's nothing anymore. And I just got this illustration coming in my mind. That the higher I go with my faith with God, the smaller my problem we're going to become. Until it disappear. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I begin just to see the situation as though it's no more. Because I'm looking at, I'm getting closer to my father in heaven. And I know he's the provider. And I know he's the, my sustainer. I know he's my upholder. I know he will never leave me or not forsake me. Therefore, I'm not going to be worrying about what is there. But then when we are coming down, the closest I get down, the bigger the house become. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Ask your neighbor, where is your faith? Amen. Another thing I noticed, we were running late. And the pilot said, you are going to excuse me. Because I'm going to take you in a higher dimension so I can use a higher speed so that we can get on time and people who suppose may lose their flight, okay, they may have problems. But I say, when we get to a particular level, they will be shaky. So put yourself to belt. Don't move. Things will be shaky. But please bear with me because when we hit the high that I'm expecting, it will allow me to go faster. Some of you just go in the plane. Me, I don't just go. I listen to the pilot. I'm getting illustrations. Hallelujah. I'm getting illustrations how God works. 
Hallelujah. So I understood that higher I go with my faith, amen, higher I go with my faith, the more challenge I'm going to face. Because the devil is realizing that this man, if he can get higher there, then he's going to go quickly. He's going to move in another dimension with God. So what do I have to do? Is to stop him. But see, trouble will come. But if you are, you can just bear with God and just go through that moment and go through that challenge, just go through that situation, what's going to happen eventually, eventually you're going to get to that place. And when you get there, you got no control. He takes hold of you and bringing you to your destiny. Hallelujah. So when you are a person of faith, you become God's friend. Because faith does not respond to I. I is the enemy of faith. Hallelujah. We do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. It means sight and faith, they are two opposite things. You can't mix them. Hallelujah. You understand? So you are looking at few fish and few bread, and you're looking at the crowd. What happened? You're afraid. But Jesus lift up his eye. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He gets the few fish, he gets the few bread, but he's not looking at it. He's looking up there because if I look here, fear will come. But if I look up there, I will see the manifestation of my God. I will see the star. I will see what God has made. And I will realize that the same God who has made this world beautiful is able to feed these people. So he said, tell them to sit down because they're going to eat today. Not only feed them, but he gave them 12 baskets. So next time when I ask you for bread, you better have one. You want to please God? You have to believe by faith. Because it's not you doing it, it's God doing it. Through you. You have no control. It's the work of God. One of the ways that I know that what I'm doing is God is when he's providing for it. When God is not providing for it, I know it's me with my ambition. So I just leave it. But when I'm doing something and God is backing it up, I know it's God. Hallelujah. And when I know it's him, I don't care about the amount. You understand? Because my God is bigger than anything. Hallelujah. I don't care about the amount. I care about how many souls will be won. How many people will be transformed. How many lives will be changed? Hallelujah. There is no amount that could save man. The salvation of man came with the blood of Jesus Christ. Life is priceless. Hallelujah. So it requires faith. Are we together? Are we together? So the next thing we talked about with you last time was about worship, right? For those who are joining us, let's just tell, tell you one thing about worship. Worship is different to praise in one sense. We praise God for what he has done, right? Brother Stephen just came here, gave us a testimony. Amen. Brother Stephen, what was your pay when you joined the city? 11.45. Today is vice president of that company. He didn't say that part, but I can say it because I'm excited. I praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I thought you were going to clap for Jesus for that one. Amen. How can God take you from that 1145 and lift you up and they put the office in your house? So I go to his house in the middle of the day. The man is on short and his vice president. Uh, we, we were say, uh, working in his computer. That's cool. I, I want a job like that. Amen. But see how everything started when they hire him, they put him to work on Sundays. And he's asking me, he said, Pastor, it's preventing me from I said, go to work, brother. God said, we'll bless the work of your hand. Go to work. But when you go there, tell God, I don't like this. Change this. And to make the whole story short, today he works at home. They put the computer in his home. They say, you work here and make the same money. And you and I, we have to drive, spend the gas, and they don't give you no gas money. And you have to put suit. And they don't give you no dry cleaning money. Amen. Nothing. And the smoke people, they get smoke break. And you don't get no break for that. Oh, 
I'm just kidding. I used to tell my boss when smoke break starts, I say, me also, I go to Bible break, sir. Come on, they smoke, I read the Bible. They'll be getting a lot of break apart from their lunch, you know? Smoke break. I need a break too to read my Bible. What's wrong with that? Hallelujah. My, my point is that you do things by faith. Amen. So praise is that. He came here, he praised the Lord for what God has done. But worship is more powerful than even praise. Because we are lifting him up for things that he didn't even do. But for who he is. Hallelujah. He is love, rather if he gives you money or not. He is the provider, rather if he provides for you or not. Hallelujah. He is the, the, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the rock of our salvation. It doesn't matter how you feel on that day. God is still God. Hallelujah. So as a child of God, you have, you and I, we have to learn how to do what? To worship him. Hallelujah. At all times, we worship him. We worship him in the midst of our storm. What will keep you worshiping in the midst of your storm? Because you know the attribute of God. Hallelujah. Let me give you one illustration only. Let me tell you about God being eternal. Amen. The Alpha and Omega. How that can help you to worship God. Okay. Papa Masu, please, can you stand? Thank you so much, Papa Masu. So, Papa Masu is born, okay? You don't have to reveal, okay? The, the year you were born. But let's say, let's say he's born in uh, 60, uh, 69, okay? No, let's give 70, in, in 1970, okay? Now, God is eternal, and God said that uh, Papa Masu's life will end in 120 years, and Papa Masu, if you get to 120 years, you will be the miserable person in the world. Because people have to give you shower there. You don't need that. You understand? But let's say God gives you all the way to 120 years. That's where you're going to live. Okay? Guess what? God is eternal means what? Before you were born in that 1970, God is. Hallelujah. When you come all the way and die over here, God is here. Hallelujah. So rather you don't worship God or you don't worship God, you, don't, you worship or you don't, before you were born over here, there were people worshiping him. Hallelujah. People were worshiping him. When you die over here, people will still worship him. So you don't change him. Your worship is more good for your own self. Because him, he will always be worshipped. I don't know if somebody's getting me. So when you come in the church, they say, let's worship God. You are not doing God a favor. You are doing yourself a favor because every time you worship him, hallelujah, and when he's excited, guess what? He's going to speak. And when he speaks, he speaks life and life more abundantly in your life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Wait, my brother. I didn't finish. The other thing you have to realize is what? In 1970, you are here. In 1980, God is here. Guess what? He prepared your 10 years old. Before you get here, he make preparation. So when you want to get to your 30 years, he's there. He prepared it for you. When you get here, he prepared for you. Before you die, what did he say? I'm going to prepare a place for you. In the house of my father, there is so many mansion. So when you die, he takes you home. So you should not be worrying about your future, about your life. Five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, because your God is eternal and he is there. He's taking care of your life. Hallelujah. You should not worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow. He said tomorrow will take care itself. Why? Because he is Mr. Tomorrow. He is already there preparing a place for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So when you come in the worship, instead of saying, God bless me tomorrow, God provide for me this, all you have to say, God, you are eternal. Amen. By just saying you are eternal, you have already prayed all those prayers. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why worship is more powerful than any form of prayer. 
That's why Jesus, when he's teaching them how to pray, he said, you must say, Alwe be the name. Lift up your hands, begin to worship God. Raise your voice and begin to tell him whatever coming from your heart. Tell him how beautiful he is. Tell him how wonderful he is. Tell him how amazing he is in your life. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we exalt your holy name. You are worthy to be praised. CNN does not inform you. Fox News does not inform you. Because you are the omniscient. You know it before it happens. There's so many people that care for us, but they are limited with resources. But you have all the resources. You are called Father, the source, my Abba, the source of my life, the source of my existence. I celebrate you. I glorify you. Hallelujah. Now listen, brothers and sisters. How do you feel when you do that? There is an atmosphere change quickly around you because God dwell in worship. Hallelujah. Worship is his food. It's where he dwell. Amen. You can't give him chicken. He doesn't eat it. Okay. Somebody's going to tell me he eat in Abraham's house. Yes, he did stay open it. He became a man to eat it. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he eats the praise and the worship that we give to him. So we got to learn to worship him in the midst of the storm because he is in that storm. How do I know he is in my, that storm? Because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. So when you are in that storm, you are not alone. Hallelujah. Bless you to my brother. You are not alone. Sometimes we forget that. So we panic. Hallelujah. The next thing the Bible tells us, which is my point here, I'm going to say that in five minutes. It's not, it doesn't have to be too long. The next thing it says here, the Bible tells us, thank you so much. The Bible tells us that Peter, when he entered, he kneeled down and Peter prayed. Hallelujah. Prayed. Peter did not just go and begin to minister to, to Tabitha. He prayed. What is prayer? Prayer is a dialogue between God and man. Hallelujah. A conversation with God. Amen. There is no conversation if I'm the only one talking. Hallelujah. Many people, they talk before God, but they don't pray. Why? Because they are the ones just talking, running their mouth. But they don't have time to wait and listen. I'm praying, but God is not moving. You are not praying, you are talking. Prayer is supposed to be a dialogue. And when you pray, you need to be quiet and listen. Because every time you pray, he's going to speak. He's going to give you instruction. When you obey those instructions, that's how you get the result to your problem. Why is God not moving in my situation? Because you are not obeying the instruction. Why are you not obeying the instruction? Because you don't know them. Why you don't know, don't, don't, you don't know them? Because you don't listen. Why you don't listen? Because you think prayer is talking. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. have to learn in prayer how to listen. It's not about running your mouth. Three hours. Today I pray. Okay, you pray, then what happened? Because if you really pray, I need to be able to ask you, what did God say? Because you were talking. I remember we were in this group of intercessory prayer team back home. You know, we were in the, the Assembly of Messenger, Bishop Albert. And one of our pastors was leading the intercessory. Every time he come to us, he said, what did God say, guys? Nothing. What did God say, that, guys? Nothing. One day he came and said, close this thing. The intercessory group is dismissed. 
Uh, why? He said, because every time I ask you guys, what did God say? God never said nothing. So you guys are not praying. He said, I'm going to start teaching you what is prayer. Then you're going to go back and pray. Because when you pray, you need to learn how to listen. Because you are the intercessor of the church. So God needs to be telling you what we need to be doing. And you as a child of God, as a Christian, you have to learn how to listen to the instruction. My people are dying for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Of the word of God. How does God speak? He speaks to you first through this word here. This is the best, the perfect word God speaks to us. The Bible. Everybody say the Bible. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If it's not Bible, it's not coming from God. He is not the author of confusion. It must be in the Bible. So after you finish to pray or during the prayer, you always have your Bible in your hand. Open your Bible and read. You fall in scripture that are answering the question that you are praying about. Amen. Hallelujah. God will speak to you through dreams. Okay? Job chapter 33 verse 14. Through vision. So don't neglect your dream. Don't neglect your vision. Pay attention to what the Lord is saying. We say, I don't understand it. There are people like Joseph who have the interpretation ability. Contact your pastor. Contact other leaders. Say, this is what I'm seeing. Hallelujah. What does it mean? And we're going to look at it in the scripture and explain to you that, oh, if you see this, mostly in the Bible, it means this. Then things become clear to you. Hallelujah. So, in prayer, what do we do? What are we doing? In that text, they don't tell us what did Peter pray about. Hallelujah. They don't tell us. But how can we know what he prayed about? I think we can know what he prayed about by knowing what Jesus prayed about. Because Peter was trained by who? By Jesus. Peter was among the three that Jesus took in the places of this kind of situation. Where he had to raise somebody from the dead, he tell all the disciples, stay home. Peter, James, and, uh, and, and John came with him. See, God is amazing. He sees things in the future. He knew that one day, Peter was going to have to pray for Tabitha. Hallelujah. So I need to bring him so he can see how it is done. So that when is that time, he's going to do the same thing. Jesus did what? He put people out. People did what? He put people out. You get that? Because he saw that. And Jesus is the scholar of the word also. Because he's quoting Isaiah, he's quoting Psalm, he's quoting a lot of things. What did Jesus do? He also learned. Elisha and Elijah did what? Put people out. Hallelujah. So you see how consistently the Bible completes itself. And as a child of God, you cannot manufacture your own thing. You have to do what the Bible says for you to begin to enjoy the result of your prayer life. What did Peter say? Luke did not tell us as he's writing. But he says something. In John chapter 11, 41 to 42, Jesus has to raise Lazarus from the dead. Let's see what he says to God. Let's go there. Are we good? Okay, John chapter 11, verse 41 to 42. What does the Bible say? It's coming. It's going to be lifting very soon. I don't know if it's here. Yeah, it's here. Amen. Then they took away the stone, because he instructed them, hallelujah, from the place where the, the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eye. Hallelujah. Up his eye. I don't want to see all these things that will make me doubt things. I don't want to see Mary who's going to tell me I will raise him next day of the day, the resurrection of the day. I, I, I want to put my eyes on the Lord. Okay? I look upon the hill. Where should my help come from? My help come from the Lord. I lift up my eyes. Hallelujah. 
And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, said what? Father, hallelujah. When he taught them how to pray, what did he say? When you pray, do what? Say, Father. So I'm assuming that when Peter kneeled down and began to pray, say what? Father. When you are saying Father, what you are saying? Change the nation need to, to, to know this by now. You're saying my provider. You're saying what? My upholder. You're saying what? My sustainer is the word pater. Hallelujah. If you go in the Hebrew, you're saying what? My source. My, my, the, my, the reason of my existence. That's what you're saying. Father. Hallelujah. So as he's saying father, is putting God that, listen, you are the responsible here. If miracle is going to happen here, it's not because of you. Prayer, recognize that you are nothing and God is everything. People who don't pray is because they believe in themselves. They think that they can do everything. But people who believe that I cannot do anything, but I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthened me, they are people who pray without ceasing because they know I have to depend on God. Amen. Listen to this quote from John Wesley about prayer. He said, I'm so busy that I have to begin my life, my morning with a time of prayer so that I can do what I have to do. John Wesley, what you're saying? When you're busy, you have to cut certain things. And as you know what we cut usually? We cut prayer. We cut the reading of the word. But he understood that I cannot do anything without God. Therefore, I need to begin with him. Because he can give me one revelation that can save me five hours of wandering. Amen. Hallelujah. John Calvin. He said, I'm so busy that I have to pray at least four hours in the morning before I begin my day. Whoa. Four hours, sir. That's a lot. What time do you wake up? Ah, oh, he learned from Jesus. The Bible said, early in the morning, Jesus will wake up and will isolate himself and he will pray. Hallelujah. When they're talking about early in the morning, it's between 3 o'clock and 4 in the morning. He's already on his knee. He's praying, asking God and commending his day. Asking God to fill him. So whatever the, the, the enemy has put on the road, he's taking it out spiritually. Because if you win spiritually, you're going to win physically. There's so much in the spiritual than it is in the physical. Daniel was waiting for the result. Daniel chapter 10. The angels say, God already answered you. But the prince of Persia has withstood you. So what did he do? He had to continue to pray. So Jesus lifted up his head and pray. He said, Father, go back to my scripture, please. Hallelujah. He said, Father, I thank you. Hallelujah. Prayer called for thanksgiving. He did not say, please give, do this. Look at them. Look at them. No. He said, I thank you. Why? That you have heard me. He didn't say anything yet. But he said. I thank you because. You have heard me. And know the evidence of faith. And he knows the nature of the father. That because he is the father. He is responsible. Therefore you need to hear him and move. Let me ask you a question. When your children call you. They say daddy. When you will come. Bring milk. You think they have doubt you're going to bring milk? You think they're asking themselves a question, where are you going to get money? They don't care. They say, Daddy, milk is finished. On your way here, get milk and get uh, uh, cereal and get and this. If you don't stop them, the list continues. You have to be quick. They say, hey, I got it, I got it. I got it. I'll call you back. Because they listen and they will hold you accountable when you show up and say, Daddy, you bring it? 
They don't ask you, are you paid? Where do you work? Do you have money? That's not the business. They believe. But you and I, we also have a father in heaven. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Somebody had told me, said, Pastor, you need to become a man of God, not a child of God. I said, no, I prefer to remain a child of God. <laughs> because when I'm a man, then I need to be responsible for certain things. I don't want to be responsible for nothing. I just want to be beggar in front of him. I just want to come to him and say, Lord, you do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remain a child of God. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter. I want to be a child of God. Because it's beautiful. That my daddy takes care of me. You need to believe in this thing and actually practice them. Are we good? So, you heard me and now go to the next verse. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. Hallelujah. What is the purpose of Jesus praying? Hallelujah. It's not for show. Jesus is not going to raise Lazarus from the dead for show. Peter is not going to raise Tabitha Dorcas for show that I'm the man of God. No. For that people who don't believe, they will believe in Jesus. What is the motive of your prayer? Many people don't get result in prayer because their motive is selfishness. is to prove people. Oh, they've been insulting me so much. They've been laughing at me. The day God will answer my prayer, they will see. The whole world will see. Your motive is wrong. God cannot bless that. Hallelujah. So, say to your neighbor, neighbor, you want to pray? You want result? Check your motive. Is that kingdom or is selfishness? Hallelujah. Let me finish with 1 Kings chapter 17, 19 to 21. Let's see another prayer here because the reason why I'm going to this is because I want to find out what did Peter pray about. And I know he can only learn from what was written already. Amen. From Jesus and from the Old Testament, how other people prayed for resurrection of the dead. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arm, carried him to the upper room where he was staying. And lay him on his bed. Okay, next. Then he cried out to the Lord. You see that? He didn't go, in the name of Jesus, receive life. In the name of Jesus, receive life. No. He said, be there. Because the power does not come from me. The power comes from the other one. And I don't even know if it is the will of God for you to die or to be alive. Hallelujah. So let me go to the one who knows everything, let me question him, what's the deal here? We jump quickly into praying pe for people. We jump quickly into action without even asking the king of kings who knows everything. And sometimes we don't get the result. So he laid the chart and began to talk to God. And listen what he's saying. Lord my God, have you brought tragedy on this widow I am staying with by causing a son to die? What is he trying to do? He's trying to find the source of the problem. Hallelujah. You go to the doctor, Mr. Walker, you say, I'm coughing and I'm, I'm having this thing. The doctor is now going to start treating you. He will give you a form. The nurse will give you a form. Say, fill up this question here. Are you feeling like throwing up? You are going to be there. Are you, for example, diabetic? In your family, what are they trying to do? To find what is the source of your issue. Because it is only when they know the source they can prescribe a good treatment. Elisha said, about the water, he said, take me to the source of the water. That's when he went to put the salt. Hallelujah. 
I was praying for somebody many years ago to get married. They said, Pastor, my age is coming now. I need to get married. I said, we're going to pray. And I'm praying for this person. In the night when I sleep, I have a dream. She's married. So I get excited. I'm like, wow. God is answering. She's going to get married soon. But then I don't understand what God is telling me. It's taking long. One day I challenge her. I said, sister, please come. Are you married? I said, no, pastor. Why are you asking me such a question? I've been asking you to pray for me to get married. She said, but when I dream, I dream you're married and it's not coming. What is it? I said, but I have a boyfriend. I said, you have a boyfriend? Where does he live, your boyfriend? He lives with me. I said, ah, I see. So you're married. I said, the boyfriend lives in another room and you in another room? I knew, but I just wanted to take precision. She said, no, together. I said, so you do things married people do? He said, yes. I said, oh, you married then? I said, do you want me to pray for marriage? Then divorce that one. Oh, but how am I going to do it? I said, go tell her that you don't want to live in sin anymore. That you need to see your parents and marry you and bring you to the church or to the man of God to pray for you. You need to go to the courthouse and take a certificate and get married for real. Okay? Tell him that. Two things are going to happen. He's going to do it if he's your husband. If not, he's going to quit you. Okay? If he quit you, then that free you. Now we can pray for your real marriage. So I knew what's going to happen. He went and told the guy. The guy said, oh, no. Pack the stuff and left. And she was like, Pastor, now he left me. I said, that's your problem. You don't believe that your God is able to give you your husband. Why are you holding on to somebody who don't respect you? If he respects you, you need to, to go to your parents. He's taking first of all, you the one paying all the bills in the house. You are a prostitute in your own home. Oh, I'm preaching bad stuff, you know. I'm preaching so bad, nobody want to say amen no more. Now people want me to close my book. People were so happy here when I was preaching. They're like, stop now. You get. No, I got to talk about that. Many people are living in sin and asking God to move. No, he can't move like that. He said, my hand is not short. Isaiah chapter 59. But it is your sin that separates me with you. So I had to rebuke that. I understood the source of the problem. Elijah is trying to find out what is the source of the problem. When they separated, it didn't take long. He brought a guy. He said, Pastor, this guy is talking to me. I said, you remember I told you what? Be tough. Okay? Be tough, sister. You will see if he's for real or he's a joker. They got married. To make the whole story short, they have children. They are happily married. You got to know the source of the problem. Where is this coming from? John chapter 9, verse 3. The disciples, they asked Jesus. Why is this problem, this person, like this? Is it his father and mother sin? His uncle? Jesus said, no, 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 no. Nobody sin. It is for the glory of God to be seen. So once you know the source of the problem, then you know how to pray. Or you just say, Lord, I thank you because this is what you have given to me. My grace, your grace is sufficient to me. I'll take it and I'll glorify you. And then you can declare goodbye worry and focus in your life. Hallelujah. It is very important. Jesus in Matthew chapter 17, verse uh, from verse uh, uh, 15 and you go down there, especially in verse 18, you will see something happen there. The disciples are praying for a child. All day, just like the prophet of Baal. You know how the prophet of Baal pray? All day. And uh, Elijah is laughing at them. He say, maybe your God has sleep. Maybe he travel. Jesus' disciples, they had the same situation. The whole day, they're praying for a child. Nothing is happening. So Jesus is coming from the mountain of transfiguration with the three other disciples, Peter included. They're coming down, and you see what's happening. Say, so your disciple, you know, this part of the Bible doesn't say it, but I'm going to add it. I'm not adding the word, but I'm just making it a little secular. Okay? Your disciples, they're just like Prophet Obal. 
I gave them my child. The whole day, they're just running their mouth. Nothing is happening. I thought because they are always with you, something is going to happen. But they nothing. And Jesus turned to them and rebuked them. People of lack of faith. How long should I put up with you? Did Jesus pray for the child? No. Jesus began to ask the parent the questions. What happened to the child? Oh, this child is like this. This happened to him. He falls down. And this and that. Jesus understood the source of the problem. That is the demon. It's a sickness. But behind that sickness, there is a demon. So in verse 18, what Jesus does, he rebuked the demon. You understand? So when the demon left, guess what? Sickness is gone with it. And the child was healed. So how are you praying? You don't even know the source of the problem. And you're just praying like that. So when you pray, listen. Hallelujah. So after Peter has prayed, I believe God told him what to do. Then the Bible says he turned to Tabitha. And the next thing we're going to talk about it next Sunday. You receive this message? God bless you. Hallelujah. What is your commitment?